All right, let's get started. Can you hear me well? Yes? No? I see some echo. Huh? Huh? Okay. No problem. Uh, if you don't hear me well, I will try to be louder. Uh, that's not a problem. Um, who speaks English? Very good. Who speaks Czech? Also good. So this, uh, this lecture is going to be in English, but let me, let me welcome my Czech colleague as well in, in Czech. Takže vítám vás i česky, já mám za úkol mluvit dneska anglicky. Pokud byste měli nějaký dotazy a nebyli jste si jistí, jak je formulovat anglicky, tak se klidně zeptejte česky, já se pokusím to přeložit do angličtiny uh, a zároveň si taky na to, na to odpovědět. OK, so uh, let's get started. Um, so this, this session uh, will be... Uh, from the perspective of uh, some slides and stuff like that, I will try to keep this to the very minimum. So I will take just uh, about hopefully 30 minutes to go through some slides to, to level set and give you some basic ideas about you know, what, is, what is going on with the cloud and with all the new technologies and stuff like that. But after that, I want to do demos. And I have like a 10 demos prepared today. So hopefully, I will be able to go through all of those demos. So you will see some live things in action. Uh, bear with me. It's uh, every time you do something live, something can, um, can break or whatever. So hopefully, all the demos will work. But bear with me if, uh, if they don't. Hopefully, everything will be OK. So the first 30 minutes, some, some talking. Uh, next, uh, let's say, 15 minutes for some demos. And then we can open up for some questions if you're going to have any. My name is uh, Tomasz Kubica. I work in, uh, at Microsoft, uh, and uh, I am focusing on, uh, on Azure Cloud. Yes? Já nevím, ale jak? No to asi nefunguje, že oni play trvali za play. Nebo je to lepší takhle? Je to stejný. All right, so we will have some echo. I need to do a long pauses, but it will work out well, I hope. So I'm with Microsoft. I'm focusing on Azure Cloud, which is infrastructure and platform as a service offerings. But I will be focusing on uh, what is going on in IT, in areas of artificial intelligence, uh, working with the data, working with IoT, Internet of Things, and some ideas behind all that. Uh, and then you will see a lot of demos. In the demos, you will see some basic infrastructure. You will see some automation that you don't have to configure the servers by hand. And we will just uh, run some desired state template, which will basically spin up complete infrastructure for us here. I will show you then how to work in a serverless manner. Hopefully, you have heard about serverless already. If not, it's not a problem. I will show you how, in a modern way, you will be building your applications. So we will see some demos in, in this respect. I will show you some IoT. So we will here deploy something to the IoT device. We will manage the device. We will uh, take, take some data from sensors. We will do some visualizations and stuff like that on top. And the most hopefully interesting part will be artificial intelligence. So uh, um, close to the end, I will show you some AI stuff. So I have uh, some uh, machine learning models I want to show you. I have basically take uh, stuffed toys of, uh, of my son and uh, did the machine learning to recognize the toys. So you will see how you can do that, how you can use it in your, in your projects, whatever you do. Uh, we will use AI to recognize faces. We will use AI to recognize emotions and things like that. So a lot of demos in, in this AI space as well. So that's what we are going to do today. Well, the, the name of, uh, of this is Life, Universe, Cloud, and Everything, which is uh, uh, somehow similar to my favorite book by Douglas Adams, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to Galaxy. Hopefully, you, uh, you have been able to, to see the movie or read the book. Um, so let's, uh, let's just uh, go on. So the first thing. Uh, the what you will experience outside and what is happening right now, and you as young people are very familiar with that, but not everyone is, is um, something we call digital transformation. I've heard a lot of marketing people co talking about this stuff, and I hate it because I'm a technical guy, but definitely this uh, digital transformation is something that is really changing the way how we work, how we, how we live, and how we do basically everything. And uh, uh, using Douglas Adams again, uh, mostly harmless. So the idea here is that this uh, digitalization and the, those digital things 
The problem is that it solves a lot of challenges we have today. It helps us cure diseases, it helps us uh, have a better business, it helps us protect environment, but at the same time it is uh, risky because there are questions around security, about data privacy and stuff like that. So it might be a little scary if you think about those things like AI and what, what is going to happen. But the thing is, uh, at least from my perspective, uh, the technology can really solve a lot of challenges, introduce new challenges, but again, the technology can actually solve those. So I'm not going to be focusing on those things today specifically, but bear in mind that there is a way how to do those things in a secure way to protect privacy and stuff like that. So there are things like authentications, encryptions, and a lot of those things, you can do those things securely. But if you start your new business and start to develop something, just don't forget about security and privacy because this is going to be the major issue with all of those digital transformation things. Now, what you can imagine about the uh, uh, digital transformation, how it can look like. So um, the one thing to think about this is that uh, we're going to be facing the era of robots. And it, it actually started already. We in Microsoft, we have our own robot. This is called uh, Cortana, uh, which, is, uh, which is designed to help you with, uh, with work tasks, like uh, you know, scheduling calendar and doing things like that. But this is not the only robot that you're going to face. Um, maybe you have Alexa. If you have some smart home and you're using Alexa to help you to turn on lights and heater and whatever, you have uh, another robot at your disposal. Maybe you have a Siri or a Google Assistant to help you with personal things and stuff like that. There are robots in the cars, not fully exposed yet, but every single car does have some aspects of uh, machine learning, a little bit of art artificial intelligence, and this is going to increase over time. The other subjects and objects are going to have robots, like your restaurant, your bank, your city, like a city of Prague. And the thing is that now this, uh, this robot, this digital assistant of yours, is basically capable of doing some negotiations on your behalf. So this robot basically works on your behalf. It helps you plan your calendar. That's a, the stupidest thing, but it is, it is the start. The thing is that those robots and their interfaces are now starting to talk to each other. And that's a very interesting thing that is happening right now. So for example, in a very near future, you're going to drive a car. The car will have its robot. If you buy Tesla, you have it right now. Uh, and many other car manufacturers are d going in this direction as well. So there is a robot in a car. So the robot understands where you go. Now you need to park somewhere and you need to pay for parking and you need to find uh, some free spot where you can park. This is something that your city is actually uh, capable of knowing. So there is going to be a Prague robot, which is basically designed to understand where you can park, how much you pay for it, and which is already available. In the near future, it will also understand if there is some free spot. Where is a free space to actually park? So in a very near future, what is going to happen, you drive somewhere and your car robot will talk to your Prague robot and they will negotiate what is the best way for you to park. So it will tell you, you can park here. It is very close to your destination, like 50 meters, but it will cost you 100 crowns. If you park 30 uh, or 300 meters, it is a little bit more far, but it will cost you just uh, 80 crowns or something like that. And it will tell you, hey, here is the free spot, you can go there. So those two robots will talk to each other to find the best parking, parking space for you. But then you have to pay. So based on your consent that you were agreed to, uh, then you need to tell your bank to actually process the payment. You don't want to get out of the car and get a ticket on a street. You know why? This is so old school. You want your car to actually pay for the parking directly to your city. And in order to do that, the car needs to talk to your bank to actually authorize a transaction on your behalf if you want to. And the bank needs to talk to Prague robot to actually negotiate pricing and stuff like that. You will see more and more of those things happening in the future and it's, it's just happening right now as we speak. For example, if you need to take a loan, you need to borrow some money, you need to negotiate with your banks because if you go to the bank website, what you see there, you can get a loan from 4%. Well, 
that, that's not an information which is really valuable for you because it's from 4%. It can be 3, it can be 5, it can be 10, I don't know. It's not a price which is designed for you specifically. So very soon your personal assistant will talk to the robots of the each individual bank and start to negotiate those terms. So you are not the one who go to the bank and ask how, how much you can borrow me and things like that. Your robot, if you want to, will actually start this negotiation with the bank for you and you will be presented with the actual options. So those things are starting to talk to each other. In a world of IoT, you can find this if you Google um, digital twins. So every object and a subject is going to have a representation in a cloud. Question? Uh, Cortana in Czech Republic, uh, not uh, right now. We're working on that. I it will come, not now. No direct uh, terms, uh, uh, unfortunately. So that's a kind of a level set. This is the digital transformation. So the other thing is, the old people <coughs> like me, sometimes what we do in a work, uh, we tend to talk a lot about projects. We like take like two years and uh, trying to find out what is the best strategy and how to design things and stuff like that. This is not how you should work as, as, as soon as you get to work. So a lot, of, a lot of things are moving now into something we call lean, lean manufacturing, lean enterprise and stuff like that. So the key idea is that you basically follow those three principles. If you follow guys like uh, guys from Tesla and SpaceX and, and other companies, those are the three things that you're doing. The first thing is that you think big, so you need to think in consequences and of the big picture. But a key thing here is that you need to start now, so not think too much about that, two years, you know, planning and stuff like that. You start right now and you get immediate feedback. You will find this in a development strategies if you have some uh, some uh, knowledge about agile and those type of development strategies from a software perspective, that's the same story, or continuous innovation, stuff like that. I will touch this a little bit later on as well. The thing is you need to start immediately, start right now to get a first feedback. You want to have a feedback from the market, from your users, as soon as possible. Like in every, every week, you want to have a feedback. And based on that feedback, what you do, you either scale, which means you things that are working, you scale them and continue doing that. And if you fail, you need to fail fast. That's a critical thing here. If you Google fail fast, you will find the, the right answers for that. So the idea is I don't want to spend two years on something that turns out to be a failure. I want to see that failure as soon as I can. Within 14 days, I want to know that the path I'm going is a wrong path. So I need to change direction. So this immediate feedback loop, this is something that you will hear about in software development, in um, product management, in pretty much everything modern which is happening today. I have the guy, uh, the kid uh, with, uh, with a bike there because the thing is it's the same idea as uh, when you're trying to learn how to ride a bike. If you want to learn how to ride a bike and if you do this in a traditional way we do with enterprises today, you would sit down with a kid and the kid will take a lecture and you will explain your kid what is a bike, how do, how do you brake, uh, how do you drive a bike and stuff like that. So after two hours of a lecture, you will put kid on, on the bike and kid will immediately fail because it doesn't help. What helps and how all of you have learned to drive a bike was that your father or mother or whoever basically take you, put you on a bike and told you, don't worry about anything. I'm going to push you right now. And when the bike stops, just jump over, jump out of it. And this, this was your first try. So no lectures, no planning, no thinking. You have just been put on the bike, the dad pushes you. And if in 10 seconds, you have experience, you have a feedback, you have already driven the bike. So this is how you build this experience. And that's exactly what is necessary to do in things like software development or modern product management. You want to start now and get the feedback as soon as you can. No two years of a planning, because that's not how you drive a bike. So the other thing is, 
uh, when you go to the companies and you, or you start your business or whatever, the key question you will probably ask is what makes your business different? How are you going to succeed? Why should I buy your product or whatever? And we will come to the technology very soon. Don't be afraid of that. So what makes you different? Basically, what makes you different is that you know what and how. What means that you know what to do, how the product or service should look like. You know who your customers are. You know their details and things like that. And you also know how. So you, want, uh, you, you know how can I build the product or you know how can I approach my customers, what is my strategy and stuff like that. In other words, what makes you unique and your business different is actually data and some logic. The data is where you know about your customers, where you know about your product, about the markets and things like that. And this how is your logic. The logic, the business logic is typically implemented in application. So the only thing that makes you different in modern era is basically data and applications. Not infrastructure, not understanding how to put the wires together, that's not the differentiator. Your data and your application, your unique application, that's what I'm buying. Now, if, if you take this uh, model, very well-known well no model for Jeffrey, uh, Jeffrey Moore, he tries to basically put this into some perspective. So in your business, you're going to have some core things and some context. Core is basically what differentiates you from the others. And a context is everything else. This is everything you have to do, but it's not a differentiator for you. And then you have a look on, is it mission critical or it's just a kind of enabling technology? Mission critical means that if you fail there, your business is over. This is a critical component. That's business critical. Enabling it's something that if you fail there, it's not that a big issue. You can survive. And then you create basically those four different quadrants. And very interesting thing to know is what is going to happen um, over time. So basically, you start idea over here. So you're an established company, and you find out something new, some new business model or new product or new whatever. And it starts over here. It's not your key business at this point, but it is your future business. So you start here. After some time, if this is good and you're successful, you will basically move this to this area. So this is a something that nobody else has. This is your value you have on the market. This is the reason why I am buying you and not your competitor. So this is a very important thing because this generates profit. The thing is that sooner or later, your competitors will take the same technology as well. So they will catch up. So it moves from here to here. It is still business critical because you cannot sell that product without that feature, but that feature is no differentiator. If you're a car manufacturer, here is a steering wheel. You never buy a car without steering wheel, at least today. You have to do it, but it's not something that is differentiating you. You're not buying Skoda because of a steering wheel, but because of something else. And that's a problem, because then over time, what you will see happening is that all your resources will happen to be here, and that's a problem. So you're spending a lot of energy, a lot of money, a lot of human resources just to do things that you have to do, but it does not differentiate you at all. And then your company will die after some time. So the thing is that you want to find a way how to move your resources back to the left side. You want to invest here, not here. But you have to do something there. So one of the things that you can look at from the perspective of IT is that basically you use some cloud services. It's, it's not really differentiating for you to understand how to via the server. That's not, a, not, that, that's not a point. You want to leverage some services there. You want to standardize. You want to automate. You want to manage the cost heavily. And then you move and free your resources to be put on this left side. I said about something about car manufacturers. Have you, have you seen what is in the cars today? If you buy Audi or Skoda or Volkswagen, you will see the same steering wheel in every single one because it's standardized. There is no differentiation in there. So what you have to do is standardized. It doesn't make sense for every single car to develop special engine. You will have a 
few engines and you will put them into multiple models. And that's how you save some money and you can reinvest on this left side. And the same thing is going on with IT. But before we come to that, uh, the other thing is the cloud is becoming very intelligent. So you will see more and more things deployed in the cloud because this is pool of infinite resources and AI and data and IoT and all of those things uh, is starting to live here in a cloud. But the thing is that sometimes you actually need to put something much closer to your users or more typically to your equipment. And a very good case of that is if you have a factory. So if you have a manufacturing factory and you connect it to the cloud, the problem is that if you're trying to measure pressure somewhere, and you want to detect anomalies in order to save, uh, save, uh, the, save the factory if something bad happens, it cannot be only in a cloud. Because if it's only in a cloud, you rely on the cloud to actually close the pipe before it breaks and destroys everything, then what about connectivity? You can have an issue with the connectivity. Maybe there is too much latency. Or your 3G network will just don't work. It, 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 it happens, right? So you don't really want your factory to blue away just because there is no connectivity to the cloud. So what you typically want, you want some intelligence to be distributed right to the edge devices, to the small computers or sensors and Raspberry Pis and what have you inside of that factory, which will prevent the factory to blow. But at the same time, you want the data to be sent to the cloud where you can do much more processing. So you need to split this. So some processing is on the edge. You want to conserve energy. You want to conserve uh, connectivity fees and stuff like that. The energy is the most important because more data you send, more energy you spend. If you have a device which is battery powered and you install it on a tower somewhere, it is very expensive to go there and replace the battery. So you really need to be highly efficient from an energy consumption perspective. So you don't want to send everything to the cloud. You want to have some local processing power and send only what is significant to the cloud. So what, what you end up doing is that you have a cloud environment for the large scale and global analytics, but at the same time, you want to distribute some intelligence closer to the edge, to the factories, to the cars. You don't want your car to brake via the cloud. If you press the brake pedal, you don't want it to wait for a cloud to, to do a response. You need to have a local, uh, a local response. Now, about applications. So in, in my days, this was uh, the typical architecture of the application. So the thick client, those kind of apps. Hopefully you don't see those anymore. I know that you still are, but that's what was in the past. Today, we should all be somewhere around this type of applications. Leveraging platform services. I don't want to take care about servers. There is no need for that. It's, it's, uh, it's old school. It's already done and already, already discovered. I want to focus on my code and on my data because that's what differentiates me. So you want to look into something like containers. I will do a demo of a containers here. You want to look into microservices architectures. So you want to de develop and deploy your applications in a completely new way with a small microservices that tend to talk to each other. Right? If you are not learned microservices yet, please do so. Because when you come to the job market, you will come to Microsoft, and I will be interviewing you. I will be asking those questions. What do you know about containers? What do you know about microservices? What do you know about platform services? I'm not interested in that, because this is old fashioned. I don't use it anymore. But the next phase, actually, is that you want to put some other things to your apps, like artificial intelligence. You will see what it means. A lot of applications you do today already have AI. Uber, does anyone use Uber here as a taxi? The driver is authenticated to the Uber in a way that the driver in the morning basically takes the phone, the phone takes picture of its face, and this is authentication, right? This is basically in Azure, by the way. So the driver is recognized by the face. That's what the authentication is. It is easy to put this into your application, and that's part of an AI. So modern applications will more and more use artificial intelligence to help users of that app to interact with that application easily. Because who likes passwords? No one. The same story is with uh, other methodologies, like a serverless. You want to develop application, and you don't want to care about where it runs. 
You want to have a coat? You want to put the code somewhere and make some cloud provider of any sort to run that code for you. You don't want to care about VMs. You don't want to care about servers. You take code, take the code to the platform, and say, run it for me. And that's what the cloud vendors, including Microsoft, of course, are doing in this space. The other thing is I, I've talked about this lean methodology. If you're into software development, but not only, the key thing here is continuous innovation. So those are the ideas that you have some intent, some idea. And the, the measure of success is how long it takes for your idea to make it to the product. Because in the real world, it's two years, three years, four years, and that's too long. Because when your idea becomes a product, and it's two years later, it's already late. You're already out of, the, out of the business, because you need to be much faster to succeed in this modern environment. And if you take a look on things like operating systems, both Windows and Linux have shortened the cycles from two years to actually six months, really, cycle of the new version of Windows and Ubuntu Linux and stuff like that. And in the application space, you want to deploy applications not three or four times a year, which is happening today. You want to deploy every single week, at least. By the way, if you go to Amazon.com to actually order some goods for you, the thing is that this is based on about 1,000 microservices, and they do change, really a new code, in average, every 12 seconds. Right? So you start your, you know, your, your purchase. You, you want to go and select product uh, from the catalog. And after five minutes, this Amazon.com is already 50 versions ahead. Right? So you release every 12 seconds. Uh, this is really extreme case. But definitely, what we see is that we are shortening the cycles of releasing features. And the other thing is, maybe you have uh, great data, but very bad app. It is no longer to be uh, that much of a problem. Because what is starting to happen is, are the micropayments for a data. You know it if you get your phone, like Android, you install some application, you pay for use. You get some additional, I don't know, armor for your game or whatever. You pay 10, 10 crowns, and, and you're done with that. So micropayments for functionality. But what is starting to happen is micropayment for a data. So maybe only thing you have which is valuable is the data, and you suck in doing applications. It's not a problem, because you can sell the data in this micropayment way. So you're not selling your data on a CD, which no longer exists, actually. Uh, not only on a USB drive or something. You send the data as soon as someone uses it. So I use your data, I pay you two crowns. So the micropayments in the data space. This is another thing that is happening right now. About the data, this big data thing is actually a pretty old idea. And here's a great example. I love this one. Uh, this guy called Matthew Fontaine Mary, who was actually American, he was a sailor in the Navy, and he injured himself. So he was not able to serve in the, um, in the, in, in the Navy anymore. He, he loved to be a captain or whatever. He could not be because he injured his knee or something like that. But he discovered that sometimes some sailors, old sailors, are actually taking a different roads through the ocean, which are not the shortest ones. You look on the map and you say the shortest way to go from Europe to US is, is this line. But he discovered that some sailors are not taking this direct link, but they are going in the different directions, but they actually come here faster or more reliable. They don't, don't damage their ships. Well, for you, because you're on a university of uh, nature and whatever, you, you already, I suppose, know that, of course, there are some uh, streams in the ocean, there might be some winds which turn to work in a patterns which keep repeating themselves. So obviously, the shortest line might not be the fastest, because you want to use some stream in the ocean to actually use it. But nobody knew. So this guy started datafication of ocean. So what he did, he started to go through the locks in, uh, in, in the ships, and he started to basically tell them, hey, you know, take the bottle, write down where you are and what time it is and so on, put, put that message into the bottle, take this bottle and throw it uh, to the sea. And someone from the sea will get the bottle, will open it, will read it, and will write down where it was and uh, what was the time and stuff like that. So with this, he actually collected 1.2 million data points 
which he then started to analyze. It was before the actual computers, so he had 12 computers, but the computer was job description of uh, 12 ladies who actually were doing calculations for him. It took him 30 years, so a very long time. But after 30 years, analyzing 1.2 million data points, he was able to actually find the better roads over the sea, and he shortened the time for the cruise by 30%, which was extreme success. So you save a lot of money doing that. So this is example of how you can use the data to actually help you with something like a business, even it's uh, many, many years old back. And the other thing is, when we will be talking about some data analytics and stuff like that, having things right is good, but it is not enough. Uh, one of the first computers called ENIAC, which was the first one who actually followed von Neumann architecture completely, uh, was developed and a few years later, I think it was some Finnish, uh, Finnish company or Finnish uh, institution, they, they tried to do weather forecast for the next 24 hours using this really fast computer, which were obviously uh, about one hundredth of what you have in, in your pocket right now from the performance perspective. But the thing is that they get a very good results. Their prediction for the next 24 hours was pretty accurate. Do you know where the problem was? Any guess? It was good prediction. It worked well. Exactly. That's a thing. It took the computer more than 24 hours to actually calculate that problem. So the data you get is very good. This is fine, but it is kind of useless. So the thing is that when you think about data analytics, more and more, it is not only about getting the right results, but getting the results at the right time. From the business perspective, you need to find the right answer when your customer is in your store. If you find out a week later, he had already bought it somewhere else. So it, it has a direct business impact. But the same thing is in a, in a, in a, in a science of a nature. If you need to analyze you know, how the water goes uh, through the rivers in order to prevent flooding, I, you need to have this information now. If you have information 14 days later when the flooding has already happened, it's good, but it, did, it didn't really solve the problem. So analyze, but also analyze at the right time. And more and more apps, and you will see it, will use the AI components in it. So today, we basically learn how to work with technology. You have some screen, you touch the screen, you need to learn how to work with that. The very next phase, which is already started, is that the, the artificial intelligence is going to learn how to be valuable for you. So I'm not going to learn how to work with an application. It's other way around. Your application need to learn how to understand me. And the thing is that I'm going to talk to it in a very natural ways. And your app will be, will be required to actually con do a, a conversation with me in order to understand how I want to interact with it. So I will tell the things in a way I like. And I expect your app to understand me. Of course, not initially, but it will need to learn. So we need to have a conversation with this AI machine. And I will show you a little bit of that as well. And by the way, from the AI perspective, uh, we are actually on a human parity already in multiple areas, in things like object recognition, speech recognition, in translations. We are in an AI space on the same level as human at this point. The thing is that a human is much more broad. So the, the humans can actually do all of those things very easily and don't have to go through the very special training. The robots need much more training and they are much more focused on the one individual aspects of it. But if you compare trained model with a human, you will find that the AI is on the same level as humans in all of those fields already. Then why cloud? Uh, let me just go through that very quickly. You pay only for what you use. That's a key idea. You are not paying for something that you are not using. If you do eShop, now it's Christmas, you're going to have 100 times more requirements for resources than during the summer, of course. So you want to scale up to get much more resources, then you want to scale down. And you pay for every second of a resource that you're spending. That's what a cloud is about. You pay only for what you use. That's a key, key idea. The second key idea is that you don't have to wait. You can start now. So who can build Hadoop cluster here? Hands up. 
Spark cluster, Kubernetes cluster. Who knows what I'm talking about? OK, thank you. Uh, never mind. Those are complex technologies. And you will spend one or two years learning how to build that up. You don't have to anymore. It's a button in the cloud that you can use. So you don't want to focus on how to build Hadoop cluster. This is already known to humans. You just want to click the button and say, I want Hadoop cluster. So you can focus on what is more important. And that's data, your data, and applications. Building clusters, sorry, we have you covered. It's a button for that. But there is no button for your unique data and for your unique applications. That's where your differentiation is. And of course, you can change your mind at any point. You can turn things off and to start different things. And basically, the idea is uh, very similar to what Newton once said, that Newton basically took uh, the existing science and existing equations and stuff like that and started to build on top. And that's how the, the Newton was successful. So he had his predecessors, and he focused on what is new, what is unique. And the same story is actually with this cloud thing. In a cloud, you will find things that are already done. Hadoop clusters, done. Spark, done. Kubernetes, done. Just click, and you have it. So rather than focusing on doing Hadoop, which will not make you famous, it's too late. It would make you famous 10 years ago, not today. You rather focus on something that is unique to you. So you take the existing things and you build on top. That's a key idea of uh, cloud. And basically, it follows this. So sometimes a lot of people, even on this university, are trying to you know, invent things and stuff like that that you don't have to invent. So, so the thing is that the, the wheel has already been created. It is available. It is a button for that. So there is no reason for not to use it. You should spend your time building on top and make yourself famous rather than building a wheel. If you discover wheel, great, but nobody will give you any money for that anymore. So let's see some, uh, some demos. So one of the things which is boring is infrastructure. If you want to need something, uh, build infrastructure in a cloud, you need some powerful machines, maybe with some, uh, some, I don't know, some GPU, some graphic processing, and stuff like that. In a cloud, what you do is that you click on the operating system of your choice. Uh, you basically say when you, when you want to place it. Uh, we'll do something like this. You want to have some machine like, uh, like this one. OK, OK. And here, you can just, just select what you want. And you're paying for a second. Here you can see some billing on the month basis. But basically, you can go through the catalog, and there are multiple things that you can, you can choose from. There is actually way more than that. So I will turn off a couple of things here so we have as much as we can. So many different machines. Maybe you want something really big. Maybe you want four terabytes of RAM. OK, if you have money for that, it's not a problem. You will find the right series over here. This is a half terabyte. And here we should have something more beefy like this one, like over here. So two terabytes of RAM, 64 CPUs, something like that, easily. You can just browse the catalog. You say what you want. Maybe you want some GPUs. Maybe your algorithm for calculations of a nature and stuff like that, some simulations. Maybe it is using GPUs. Oh, well, not no problem. The GPU is something that is very expensive if you want to buy it. But if you want to get it just for one hour, it will cost you like two dollars. You will pay two dollars, and you will get incredibly big big machine with two GPUs in it, and it will be very cheap because you're using that just for one hour. And that's a key change in, in a thinking of a multiple companies. You don't have to own everything. You paying for what you use. So when the day is over, you want to scale down your application. If your customers are active over day, why you are paying the same amount of money overnight in a server that you have already bought? You want to really scale and pay only for what is really needed uh, for your case. All right, so that's, uh, that's how you build infrastructure. So the other thing is, 
you might want to start automating because you know clicking here in some GUI is nice it's good for start but as, as soon as you start really to leverage that you might want to maybe build your computational cluster using automation so let me show you how this actually might uh, look like so I have some uh, some scripts prepared here let me just uh, go to the right place all right so I am going to create some uh, basic things. It's something like a folder in which I want to put my resources. I want to build some networking because the things need to talk to each other. And then when this is over, I need to build some server farm. A couple of servers that I want to you know, talk to each other and do things. All right. Okay, I probably have misspelled that. Good. That's a good thing about live demos. Easy groove deployment create. This should be fine. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yes. So let me fix it here. Uh, let me put it there. For what now? So what should be happening that we should see a new kind of a folder happening here? Okay, that's that's the one. So my resources are starting to be built here. We started with some basic things like networking in, in this case. So we have some networking being created there. And then I want to run a script, which is basically not a script, it's kind of a desired state configuration thing. It's a Another discussion for a pretty long time, but it will look something like that. So basically, it's a, if you're not familiar with, it's a JSON structure. It's basically just a data structure that tells the cloud what you want there. So I need to deploy some storage. I need to deploy some load balancer. I need to deploy some virtual machine, some network interfaces, and things like that. This is something that in a real world of a physical equipment, you will do like uh, two months to put those things together. Uh, but here, we should be much more quicker doing that. Uh, so this is basically a description of your infrastructure. And there are some input parameters which I'm using here. And those parameters will basically tell me how many VMs of individual type I actually want there. So I will use this. So I will say I want five servers on the front end with a load balancer, and I need five services on the back end. And this is just a number, and I can change the number and get 10 or 2 or 100. We are in the cloud, so everything is possible if you want to pay for that, of course. So this is done. So I'm going to run this uh, particle thing here. Okay, I need to put O. Good catch. All right, and the things will start happening, right? So this is something that I have prepared. I have this in my pocket, and any time I can repeat it. Any time I need my infrastructure again, which, uh, okay, so let me put it without the arguments first. Let me start by that. Let's see. So I will have this template, and I can repeat this template any time. So you, you want to build your environment? Well, do that. It will take some time, like five to 10 minutes, I would say, and you will build up your complete environment. And basically, it's, it is already started. So if I have a look here in a GUI, what is happening? I already see a lot of things uh, happening right now. I have uh, some load balancer. I have some network interfaces. I have yet another load balancer. I have some public IP. And uh, things are pretty rapidly starting to, starting to be happening here. So if I refresh again and again, after some time, I will see the VMs showing up. So you can basically build complete environment in like 10 minutes. And then you can destroy it in another five minutes. So rather than focusing like one month to build something up, you will create this template and you can repeat it anytime. And the thing is, it's a just a JSON structure. So it will always work. If you have a hundred pages document with a screenshots and click next and then next and then next, 
then uh, if you go through that document, it will take a long time, but you will most likely make some mistake. You will click somewhere else, and the situation will not be where you want to be. So with this template, you can actually completely automate your infrastructure. And basically, the similar things, we can see some disks, some VMs already showing up. Basically, you can use this technique to pretty much anything, to build infrastructure, to release your applications. Pretty much everything today can be automated uh, using those principles. And this, uh, if you want to Google that, this is called desired state template. Uh, so it's not a script, it's a desired state. So you basically say how I want my environment to look like, and you say, OK, make it so. Any Star Trek fans? Star Trek, no one? OK, I'm too old, fine. Uh, there is a captain who always say, uh, get some suggestions and just say, make it so. Uh, and that's basically what we're doing here. So you have uh, some template and you say, OK, make it so. So the things are going on here. And if you don't want this anymore, you can just you know, turn it off. And the similar way that you have put this together, you can delete that. So I will do this right now. So I will do, do, do that. And it will start the process of deleting things. So you can deploy your infrastructure in 10 minutes. You can destroy it in five minutes and stop paying for that. That's how you operate in a modern environment. If you go to the job interview and they are using cloud already, those are going to be my questions for you. How you can automate? Do you know some automation tools? Do you know how to work with a desired state templates in any kind? It does not have to be this one, but those principles really apply uh, for operating the cloud. OK. so. This was about playing with uh, virtual machines. And that is, uh, that is good. But today, the most exciting projects are happening with containers. Uh, I'm not here to explain how the containers work. It would take me another one hour. That's a different way how to think about infrastructure components. And it's way more efficient, way more faster, and way, way easier to live with. Um, so what I want to show you is I will show you Kubernetes, which is a cloud orchestration. It's a container orchestrator, happened to be in a cloud. Um, and uh, I have some, uh, some nodes there. Maybe I will do this a little bigger. So this is my cluster. I have cluster with uh, seven nodes there. And uh, I have deployed one application to it already. And I have one instance of that application running. And here it is. And it's, uh, it's on a public IP. So let me just get that IP, and I will just try to talk to it. All right. So let's do something like this. Do curl. Sorry about the command line. Maybe something like that. OK. So the application is running, and I have one instance. That crazy thing there is an ID of an instance, so I know how many instances I do have. So I will open yet another one here. And I will see my deployments. And what should I see that in my desired state, this is yet another desired state thing, I have, I want one instance of that application, right? So if we take a look on how do I actually specify that application, here it is. So that's an, I'll make it a little bigger again if I can. Okay, good. So this is a desired state template of my application. This time, this is not JSON. This is YAML. But again, it's a data structure. Nothing really, really fancy going on here. And the key thing here is here I am specifying how many instances I want. And it's a Christmas, and my application is crazy popular. So what I want to do, I want to have 100 instances, not one, but 100. So now, if you're in a physical world, you need to order another 99 servers or spin up another 99 VMs. I don't have to do that because I am in the world of containers. So what I want to do now, if I find the right window, all right. So I will just apply this new template. Let me do that. And what we should see. We should see that after some time, it needs to download those components. It will start to increase number of instances. So the number you see here is changing is actually a number of instances that are running. So my application right now is 100 times more performant than before. So that's how I easily increase the load, how I easily deploy things. And if I go back to this window, I don't know which, which was it. 
maybe this one, you can see that I get responses for very different instances. So I'm already load balancing traffic to all of those instances. So from 1 to 100, it took me like a couple of seconds. But what if you need to change your application code? I need to get a new version of my app, all right? So we are in uh, the world of containers. So what you do, you create a new version of your application, you change the code, and you basically build a new container image. So you're not upgrading the existing one, you just create a new one. And my image is actually with a tech number two. So what I want to do now, I want to upgrade those 100 instances of my application with a new code. So we should see that some new functionality should be happening, uh, happening here. So I've modified the template. Let me just run it now. Here I will see that the Kubernetes will try to replace some of those with a new versions. And if I have a look on my application, from time to time you can see response for, from the new version. So now we have a mixed cluster with a few version one, few version two, but after pretty short time, we should upgrade all the 100 instances to the new version of my application. And that's exactly how you work in the modern environment using containers and microservices. And there are quite a few applications on the market today that is used in Azure and this type of, uh, of processing, like uh, Car Configurator for, for Škoda or uh, Portal Občana, which is uh, the, the government interface. And here we go, so you're on the new version. If you screw up and you find out hey, that was a big mistake, I don't want this version, I wanna go back to the previous one, well obviously what you're gonna do is, you will just change your desired state. So you will go back and you will just apply this new desired state and what should happen is that you will roll back. So basically your 100 instances will be again switched from the version two, which is hello, to version one, which is just hi. So that's what you do uh, in, the world of, uh, in the world of containers. So those are the topics which are kind of a touching infrastructure. So we have been looking into virtual machines, all right, that's the basis for everything. And if you wanna live in a world of VMs, you can, it, it makes sense to run VMs in a cloud. Then we have been talking about automation on the infrastructure level. And then you can have a next step, which is rather than using VMs, you can use containers. And then for automation of this, you can use some container cluster like uh, Azure Kubernetes Service in my case. So that's what you do with uh, containers. But you kind of still have to deal with infrastructure anyway. So I would like to show you something that is, is less focusing on infrastructure. And I want to focus much more on application logic. So let's do, let's do this demo. So now, please, help me out. There is some voting application, just nonsense. Just try to uh, open it uh, in your QR reader. I will do this as well. It will not do anything interesting on your phone. It will just enable me to do something there. So let me just try that. OK, I'm there. Pretty good. I have not set this up to refresh automatically, so don't expect that it will refresh automatically. I need to hit refresh button. But before, I want to show you a little more about you know, how this is done and what is happening in the background. So one of the things uh, that is happening, I want to send this information out. So I want to send this to uh, Microsoft Teams, which is communication platform. You can use uh, Slack if you, if you prefer. So if everything is fine, and uh, we will see. I see a couple of votes going on here in my chat window. So I have integrated this application in my chatting system. It can be Skype, it can be whatever. In my case, it's, it's Microsoft Teams. So I'm just sending information there. But I don't want to write too much of a code. So I, I want to show you how I've done that in a way that I don't really need to take care about infrastructure. There is no single server and no single container in this demo. Just refresh to see how many of you have actually voted. Wow, good. So let's see what is going on. So here, what you will see is a serverless. I don't want to care about infrastructure at all. I want Microsoft or any other cloud provider to ca take care of that. So it, it all started with a URL. This, uh, this uh, QR code actually leads to the URL. 
And this URL is something we have here as a serverless platform. So it is just my code, and I don't specify any server, any sizing, any things like that. I just have a two functions here, serverless function. And this is the only thing I have to, had to code. You can see that it's not very clever or long. So it, this is a JavaScript code, which basically listens on this URL. So this URL is as a service. So there is no server behind that I would manage, no container behind that I would manage. I've just pushed the code, and I'm telling Cloud, hey, here is my code, run it for me. And what you're paying for is execution of a code. Not the time or things like that, you pay just for every single execution. So what my code is doing is that it takes some binding. Because you know I need to write this down to some, to some database. But I don't want to write this to the database directly. You know, you know why? Well, you know, the database can have some performance settings. And if all of you start to click this button, it might overload my database. I, I, I don't want your you know, requests to fail. So I want to first put it in a queue into something we call Event Hub. So queue as a service. So what I want, I want to take this vote that you just did, and I want to send it to the Event Hub, which is a queuing system. I don't want to write to the database directly because I will override the database. So how do I do that? Well, there is an integrate button. So I don't want to write a code to authenticate to that uh, service bus. I don't want to write that. It, it's too much work for me. I'm lazy. So I've just put this integration thing here. So the platform itself doing this authentication and put those things together for me, I don't have to do that. Uh, and I just you know, send the context to this particular thing and just send the data I want there in my event hub, which basically just is when it was created and how I voted. And it goes to this component, which is called event hub. Right? So I should see quite a few messages. And I, 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 I do. There is like 120 or 140 messages in that, in that bus, in, in this queue mechanism. So now I need to take the messages out of this hub and start to do things with it. So again, I don't want code lazy. I don't want to take care about infrastructure and patch management and all those things. So I'm using another serverless component, which is called uh, Logic Apps in our environment. In other clouds, you will find a different naming for that. And this is how the Logic Apps look like. And that's how I implement the functionality. So let's see. So I want to trigger that every time there is a new message in that bus. Right? That's my trigger. So if there is new message, wake up. OK, so I wake up. I want to take this message and parse it, because I want to play with that. So I just do some basic JSON parsing, technical detail. But then I want to write it down to the database. So with this step, I'm actually taking the data and writing it to the database. I will show you database in a minute. It's not a traditional transactional database that you might probably heard of already. This is the world of a NoSQL databases. If you have not heard about NoSQL and you're interested in data, definitely Google NoSQL and look into things like MongoDB and document stores and stuff like that. So I'm writing this to the database. And then also, I want to post message uh, to my uh, MS Teams. But in the same way, I can use this tool to post message to Facebook or uh, post article to my WordPress environment, uh, whatever. There are a lot of connectors which are available there. So that's how I actually ended up having all of those votes in my chat window over here, using this type of integration. No coding, just you know, filling the things and you know, putting, putting that in, uh, in the right order. So that's what I have did. And then it ended up in this uh, database. And as I said, this is not a traditional relational model. Uh, this is uh, document store, JSON store. Uh, very interesting way how to deal with the data. Uh, so we can actually have a look on the data structures here. So I should see for every individual vote, I should see a JSON document representing that vote. It's, it's very simple to know, so there were nothing really fancy there. But here I see all votes. And this is the document has been created. This is a, the way how this database works as a document JSON store. 
and I can put some questions to the database and stuff like that. Before I actually show you the visualization layer, I want to show you that this is a, a cloud database. So I can basically replicate it to any other places around the planet. If you are in the gaming uh, industry, I have a customer from a gaming sector. In the gaming, if you play online games, we need to put you in a room so you can play online game with some, someone else, right? And for that, you need very low latency. So if you're from Japan, I don't want you to connect to the data stream which is in Europe because it's too far. It will be big latency and then the game will not work in the way that you want to. So you want to replicate the data to multiple places around the world. So what you can do basically that you say I want it here, here, maybe in Brazil, maybe in Australia and uh, maybe here in Japan. And that's it. And basically, when you now are fine with that, you just click Save. And what is going to happen on the background, it will create another database instances in those other parts of the world and will start to replicate data to that world. Of course, you pay for every single instance here. So more you have, more you pay. But that's a cloud. You pay for what you actually use. So that's how you can deal with this uh, problem of a data. But now, I wanted to have some visualization like this one. I don't want to code that. I don't like it. So I just uh, take a platform which is ready for that. We call it Power BI, but there are other platforms like this on the market. So basically, I have just connected that to my data source, which is my database. And I just drop some widgets. I just drop widgets on the left, on the right. I, I did that. And that's all I had to do. So I can actually present my data. So if you are uh, trying to have a project around nature, and stuff like that, the most important thing to get money is to be able to present that solution. Because nobody understands equations, nobody understands Excel tables, everybody understands nice, nice graph. So that's a tool which you can use to actually visualize and create interactive dashboards in which you can click and it will you know, select things and, and, and do, the, uh, do the queries and stuff like that. All right, good. So this is an example of uh, using serverless platform. So no container, no VM, and we have build application, which kind of does something. It gets some endpoint. You call the endpoint from your phone. It writes it down to the hub, which is a queue mechanism. Something else is waiting on the queue. If there is a new message, it will take it, send it to the database. And on top of the database, there is a visualization layer, which will print the nice graph. No VMs. No operating system to manage. You don't care about any of that. You care about your logic, and you care about your data. That's a key idea. All right. Now, I will switch to IoT, but I will spend a very little time there, because I, I want to move to AI, the artificial, artificial intelligence, which is the most sexy of, uh, of all of those demos, I guess. So the thing is. I have some IoT system deployed here. It can be Raspberry Pi, it can be machine with a Linux or Windows, whatever. Um, and there is a platform to actually manage all that. Um, so I can have a multiple devices here. I don't have any. Those devices can be like uh, Arduino microcontrollers for your sensors. You can watch various things that you want when doing uh, research projects like uh, water flow, chemical you know, capabilities or things like that, humidity, temperature, whatever. But I also have an IoT Edge device. So this is a device which I'm using in a way to actually send some logic down to that device itself. So I don't want to process everything in the cloud. I want to process something in the cloud, but something on the device directly. And guess what? Of course, the way how you actually send those functionalities down there are containers, right, again. So there is some platform that you install on the device. And then the platform installs Docker, which is uh, the containerization platform. And basically, what you send there is the Docker containers with individual functionalities. So in my case, I have something like a local hub, which is a gateway. So the other devices can talk to this device, which I'm managing from the cloud. And I have deployed a couple of modules there. So I have a a module which is uh, getting readings from a temperature sensor every second. So it gets input every second. Then I wire it to go to my transform module, which is a module which is using serverless uh, development methodology. So it is using Azure Functions underneath. 
but it is deployed to the device itself. And this module actually transforms pressure from bar to atmospheres. So I do some, some basic manipulations here. But then I'm running aggregation module. Because the thing is, I want to need the data locally every second, but to the cloud I want to send just average of a 60 seconds. So I need something that will do this average for me. So that's a functionality that is available in a cloud, but I can actually deploy it down there. So here I have some uh, query for that. So this is a system which is designed just for that. It will basically take a tumbling window and it will do 60 second average, will get the result and send the result to the cloud. So I am managing this everything from the central location in my cloud and I'm sending the functionality down to the device itself so the device will do things for me. And then uh, if I want to visualize that, of course, I have a tool for that, so I don't have to write anything. I can just go to this tool, which is connected to the, to the event hub where the messages are, and I can just start to do some fancy visualizations. I don't want to code anything. I just want to see some nice graphs. So I've uh, connected the systems together. I can see my machine temperature, and I have a graph over here. And I can do things like maybe I want to zoom in here, and maybe I want to take this, first I want to zoom, and then I want to see the actual reading, so I want to explore events, and here I have the actual values. So this is a kind of a viewer for the IoT data, but I don't have to code it, I don't have to write my own app, I can do it right away this, uh, using these methods. All right, so, so we have some time for questions. Let's now jump into the world of AI. All right, so. We actually do have a couple of cognitive services which are already trained. So you don't have to train it. So we have a service which actually can recognize whether on the picture is a real donkey or real sheep. The thing is that I don't have a real donkey and a real sheep. I have a stuffed toy. Of course, our model is not trained for that. So I don't have a model that I can use right away. But you can now train the machine learning algorithm using your data. So let me tell you what I did and how it worked. So I've just taken those two animals, and I've taken uh, different pictures. The thing is that I want pictures from a different angles, with a different backgrounds, with a different light conditions and stuff like that. And then I need to tell the system where is donkey and where is a sheep. And you can see that they are pretty similar. So it's, it's quite kind of a difficult for the robot to actually understand it properly. So what I have to do, I have to teach the algorithm. So I need to you know, take the mouse and say, hey, this is a donkey. I've already did that. So this is a donkey, uh, this is sheep. So I had to go through all of the samples I've put there. You need as much samples as you can, of course. More samples you have, more accurate your machine learning model is going to be. So I have put those things there in uh, various uh, you know, positions and various backgrounds and stuff like that. And then I have run a training algorithm. So I've clicked here on this train button and I said, hey, now this artificial intelligence needs to learn. In my case, it's very simple, just a two tags, just a few pictures, so it takes really short time. In a real world, you should have much more data because machine learning is about a lot of data and you have your system learn based on the data which you put on input. All right, so I've did that and then I have a two pictures which are actually not in the first set. So this is a new data. So you basically take the data on the input, you train the model, and then you use this model to analyze new data. That's a key idea. Every time you have a new donkey picture, you don't want to run through that algorithm again to train the model. It takes a lot of time and a lot of resources. So you want to train the model and export the model. And then the model is can then easily be used to actually check what is there. So what I did, I have take a different picture but in a very similar conditions, and the machine already recognized with some probability, that's a key thing which we will uh, have to talk about later on, uh, with some probability that this for 99.8% is a donkey, and this is very likely a sheep. So the machine learning discipline is not about being sure. It's about finding the level of similarity. So this worked pretty well, 
Even I have just the 30 images on the input. I should have much, much more inputs here. So it is able to recognize those. So I tried something a little more challenging for the robot. So I've put something here. Uh, and this is way more complicated because those two animals are put together so some parts of their body is not visible. So it's, it's way more complicated for the robot to understand. So especially in the case of a donkey, you can see that a probability is a little lower. It's like 82 percent, but that's, that's still quite, quite good. So we have been able to recognize those two animals, but you can see that I have some other guesses here. So if I lower my probability threshold like this, you can see that the robot actually recognizes some other objects, and it thinks it's a little like a donkey, but with a much less probability. That's the probability is a key thing to understand in machine learning. So here is crocodile. And the crocodile looks from the 30 person like a donkey. Of course, the machine learning model is not viewing the pictures the same way as our brain is viewing those pictures. But if you would like, you can train the model also for the crocodile. And it will be very easy for him to understand that it's a crocodile. But it has some aspects from the machine learning perspective that looks a little like a donkey. But the probability is fairly low. So if you set your limits right and you want to say, I want only 70 or something more percent of accuracy, you will get a very good result. Now think about this. It's just uh, about 25 images on input. If you have a thousand images, you can train the model extremely well. So it will be very, very accurate in predicting what is on the picture. So you can use models which we have already created for you. That's a one way. Or you can train the model with your own data. So if you're able to recognize different birds, because that's what you do, our machine learning algorithm, which is pre-trained, will say, this is a bird, this is a donkey. But it will not understand what type of the bird it is. But if you have the data, if you have 1,000 pictures of a bird, you can just put it there and put that input and train the model, teach the AI to actually understand what is on a picture, and then you can use this algorithm fairly easily. So this is a as a service thing, so you don't have to code. Of course, if you want, we have a lot of services which allow you to actually write your code in R and in TensorFlow and, and stuff like that. But if you want to have a push start, just get a platform that is already there and train it with your data. We have the same platform to understand speech and stuff like that. All right, and before we open up for the questions, I want to show you another two or three demos in, in, this, uh, uh, in this space. So one thing that we can try is uh, emotion detection. So let me try that. I'm, I'm not an actor, so it will be difficult. So hopefully, that was, that was easy. OK, now neutral is also easy. <coughs> OK. Uh, I'm not an actor. OK, so maybe it's surprised. <laughs> OK. Um, so it works like that. So there is an algorithm which is already trained. So we can understand how old are you, pretty much. We can understand if you're a male or a woman. And we can understand some eight basic uh, emotions. So this is a model which is already trained. So you don't have to train it. You can just use it. It will cost you like uh, $1 for every 10 calls you, you, you put into the system. So it's fairly easy. But if you need to have something more specialized to train it on your data, then you can definitely train it on your data. And the same thing is you can actually put this into, uh, into video. And you can have the robot to actually analyze the video. If I find the right, uh, right one, I'm not sure which one it is. This is the one. OK. So I have downloaded some of your videos. So hopefully, I will find it out where I have it. OK, maybe here. Oh, yes. OK, good. All right, so that's your video. And let's see what the robot thinks about it. OK, maybe I've run out of uh, the free credits. OK, let me just see if the visual features work. OK, that's better.
So it's a pre-trained model which is trying to analyze what is happening on the screen. So it recognizes that there is some sign, there is some bike, something looks like a wedding there, good. Some swimming, there is a swimming pool, so that's how we know, right? So it's a, again, it's a game of probability. It's not that it's 100% sure that the things are in the way that is shown here, but it is trying to use some probability mechanisms to help you better understand what is, what is happening there. And unfortunately, I've probably run out, but no, no, it's fine. So now it's analyzing faces, and it's trying to uh, put some idea, whether it's a male or a woman, or uh, the, the age, uh, what the robot thinks it is. So if things go well, you're able to recognize the face, but you also are able to recognize that the face which was on the beginning is the same face which was on the end of the video. So you can actually use this uh, for multiple things. You can, for example, uh, have a camera in your store to understand how long the people are staying in the store. You don't want to put any GDPR things and stuff like that to identify correct person, but you might want to know how many people are on the football stadium. And you don't want to count every face uh, because uh, you, every unique face, that's, that's what you want to count. Right? So that's, uh, that's what you can do uh, with this one. And here you can see that most of the people there are pretty young, which probably is about, uh, about right. And let's see if we can see some objects. So this has been a table. Those are glasses. This is flag, which is also pretty accurate. There is a flower here, and so on. All right. And the very last thing before I open up for questions, you can use AI as a robot in your system. So let's try it. This is an insurance company. Hello. OK. Here's a robot. Good to know. Um, I need insurance. OK. So the roller will ask me, what type of insurance you want? Automotive or life insurance? Let me restart that. I don't want to be, I want to be more specific. I don't want to choose from those, so I will now do something else. I have bought a car and I need insurance. So I expect this robot to not to give me the, the list of the options I have, but understand that what I want is actually a car, which didn't work right now. OK, never mind. So I can put uh, what I need there. I'm existing customer. So it needs to authenticate me. Uh, there is a guy in this demo who, oops, who can actually be used. So let me do that. OK, that's me. Uh, no. OK, some pin, which will be, for the demo purposes, something like that. And what is happening on the background? This chatbot is actually talking to my CRM system. In, in a database of a customer. So he understands who I am because I have authenticated. And he understands that I have, a, uh, I have a daughter. And maybe the daughter can use my insurance as well, and I can get some, uh, some uh, discounts out of that. So yeah, that's, that's uh, a good deal. So I will say yes. And now I need to tell what type of a car I want to have insurance on. So I want to put SUV here. OK, what to make of the car? OK, so let's say Škoda. What type, I guess, model? OK, Kodiak. It will look into the database of the models. It's an insurance company. Uh, I guess it will be like 2017. Yeah, I do have a photo of a car. Upload the photo. OK, let's do that. So go over here. And that's my SUV, right? OK. Yeah. 
All right. Doesn't look like an SUV. OK, you're probably right. OK, so I will do the right one. Looks great, nice purchase. Yeah. All right. Now it will talk to the backend systems and will try to negotiate some pricing. And I will be presented with some pricing. And there's a pricing. OK. I do not like that. That is way too expensive. I hate you. So what is going to happen now is that this robot will actually use yet another cognitive service, which actually tries to find a sentiment. So it will understand that I'm really angry and will automatically switch over to the real person. So you can analyze how you interact with a guy. And if you see something very bad, the guy is nervous or it's, uh, it's blunt or it, it's not happy with that, you can say, OK, I as a robot, I'm finished. I, I cannot help you anymore. But I will give you Jane, which is the real person. And that's what is actually happening uh, right now on a lot of sites that you might know already. They are using this type of uh, robots to actually help the people out. And there are many, many cases where, where this kind of a chatbots are are used. All right. So the fit is, if you want to know how to start, it's fairly easy. Uh, your university is already using Azure for some of its projects. So just ask your IT what they think about that. There are some projects going on already. If you want to have this for your own purposes and you want to play or you're starting the new business, there's a free trial. So you can get there, you will get some free credit, you will get some free services, including those cognitive services. For some basic levels, you can get it for free. And you can also have a look on some other research projects. For example, if you're up to quantum computing, you can actually start writing applications for a quantum computer, which does not exist yet, but the language is already prepared and the simulator is ready as well. And if you have uh, your kids or you want to help us with teaching kids how to code, there are a couple of things which, which we do. And you, your kids can actually start learning how to code. And if you are not a kid and you want to learn more about AI and IoT, we actually have an AI school and an IoT school. So just go there. You will find a lot of lectures from the very basics all the way to the intermediate and expert, expert level. And just uh, uh, give it a try. So that's all from me. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to open for questions. Thank you.